Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am at my most nervous probably when I'm shooting these thumbnails. You see how it was leaning? That big tower of media was leaning. Why would I pick it up and hold it in front of the camera? Why wouldn't I just shoot it like, hey guys, here they are. No, I have to hold them. I have to, oh, and then it's this dance, like something out of it. It's like a Keystone Cops caper. Um, guys, we are talking about Kino Lorber studio classics and beyond i am so tremendously excited for this video because we have every single kino lorber studio classics release for november 2021 if you're watching this video it's not november yet we have first looks for you guys every single title from the november release schedule except for one because it's not here yet it's 4k it's gonna get its own video so stay tuned like like Alex from A Clockwork Orange. Uh, let's just jump right in. We got so much ground to cover. Let's jump right in. Night Gallery, Season 1. So exciting, right? Kino with the TV titles. I mean, Buck Rogers, uh, Kolchak the Night Stalker. All those TV movies. Now we've got Night Gallery. Of course, this is Rod Serling in the 70s. The man who built the Twilight Zone, who opened the portal to the Twilight Zone. Uh, the icon, Rod Serling. Um, doing his thing late 60s into the 70s. So this is the first season. This is the short season, right? There was a pilot that was feature length, uh, you know, hour, 38 minutes. It would have been a two-hour time slot, I guess, in 1969. Uh, and then the six-episode first season. So it's a shorter season, but bucko, this is loaded. Look at all the special features. We've got multiple commentaries for the, the same episodes. We've got... I mean, my goodness, commentary for the pie. Look at all those commentaries. There's a booklet, uh, the syndication conundrum. A look at the show's troubled second life in reruns. A feature up by film historian Craig Beam. Holy cow. Amanda Reyes is here, the author of Are You in the, or the editing author of Are You in the House Alone, the book about TV and TV movies because, I mean, my goodness, there's so much stuff here. So here's outside of the slipcase here, uh, the art interior. You know, this art is the same. Two discs. Because, again, it's six episodes in a, in a movie. Um, let me show you the episode guide. Looks nice, doesn't it? All right. Here we go. <laughs> Try to keep my fingers out of the frames, and you can freeze frame that if you want to see exactly what is included. When I hold things up like this, the camera doesn't want to focus. So hopefully that's clear enough to focus. Um, but I mean, my goodness, you guys, the, the stars that were on this show, we got Ossie Davis, we got Joan Crawford, we've got, uh, Jackie Vernon, Phyllis Diller, John Aston. Um, who else do we want to shout out? Diane Keaton. So many people associated with this show. Um, I believe on the back, they mentioned, uh, Roddy McDowell, Burgess Meredith, Agnes Moorhead, uh, cinematic, their direct, the episodes were proving grounds for fantastic directors, right? Steven Spielberg. Did, a, did an episode here. So much great stuff. So um, as with everything we're going to talk about, because I do need to move kind of fast with these because we have so much ground to cover, over 30 titles. Um, keep your eyes peeled to serialatmidnight.com and the outlets where I actually review things because if you're only watching the videos, you're missing so much. I have gotten back into the habit of writing reviews almost every single day. They go up at serialatmidnight.com and they go up at uh, Letterboxd and they appear in the critics section of IMDb. So keep your eyes peeled because this is not our last conversation about these titles. Let's talk about Chato's Land. Chato's Land. This is, uh, first of all, Charles Bronson. This is an amazing. I love what Kino Lorber does when they present these slip covers with the art or alternate art, you know, because sometimes, check this out. We've got multiple pieces of art, and these images are so iconic. They're so beautiful. Um, and I love that we get multiple options. You know, we get to look at different kinds of art. I believe, yeah. So if you like the other one, that's included as well. If you want to flip that around, you're like, I don't like, I don't know why you wouldn't like this because that's just amazing. Was Charles Bronson ever that ripped in real life? I don't know. Anyway, Charles Bronson, Jack Palance. This is a 1972 Western um, Jack Palance and a Western with Charles Bronson. Uh, Kino Lorber really focusing right now on Charles Bronson as you're going to see with Breakheart Pass coming the same 
same month, another November release. Uh, Alistair McLean, Mc, McLean's Break Heart Pass. This is a 75 Western. Uh, 72, right? 72, 75. I can't remember if this has... Oh, it does. It does have the alternate artwork here. Oh, I'm... Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, and then that's... That art is inside as well. I'm not doing justice to these special features. And I hate moving so fast, but I haven't watched most of these yet, right? They've just come in. I have an advanced look. I'm able to give you a hands-on look at these so you can pre-order with the most information, right? So you have a good uh, opportunity to be like, well, that I have to have that, right? And then you can go make an informed decision with your money. Uh, so Chato's Land has an audio commentary by film historians Howard S. Berger and Steve Mitchell. Interview with the screenwriter Gerald Wilson and the theatrical trailer. I'll hold that up for you. You can freeze frame if you so desire. Breakheart Pass has a... Oh, the same same cats. Howard S. Berger, Steve Mitchell, and Nathaniel Thompson on the commentary and the theatrical trailer. Hold that up for you. It's a lot of Chuck Bronson right there. All right, we move on. Homebodies. Uh, this is, this one, if I remember correctly, this has three pieces of art. Piece number one, piece number two, and, yep, piece number three. Uh, this is about old people in a building who um, start killing people. <laughs> it's a dark... You know, dark comedy. A murder a day keeps the landlord away when six mild-mannered senior citizens are told that their old brownstone is going to be torn down. They don't take the news lightly. Uh, and then the murders start. So we've got an audio commentary by director Larry Eust. Interview with producer Marshall Backlar. And a TV spot and theatrical trailer. I'll hold that up for you guys. I love these slip cases. Do you, what do you guys think about these? Slipcases are always super controversial. I mean, everything's controversial, right? Like, hey, it sure is a nice day outside. Don't you dare stuff your blue sky agenda down my throat. Everything's controversial now. You know what's not controversial? To Hell and Back, the biography movie, the biopic. The biopic, if you want to do that. Uh, hey, did you go to the doctor and have that biopic done? Um, anyway, to Hell and Back is the Audie Murphy story, essentially. He was the World War II hero that, uh, as I always like to say, the character in Inglorious Bastards, the German, the sniper character who had become the war hero, that is Quentin Tarantino twisting and flipping the story of Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy was that hero for America. Uh, well-decorated World War II hero, the most decorated American soldier of World War II, plays himself in this gripping, action-packed saga. It is the story of Audie Murphy in World War II with Audie Murphy starring. That's how he became a star. He came back from the war, and he had all these opportunities. He was in westerns. Here's the thing. Audie Murphy was never a particularly great actor, but he was real. He had see the things he had seen and done in the PTSD that he really suffered from in real life. And of course, he died younger than he should have. It's kind of a tragic story. But he soared too. He he soared to great heights thanks to uh, his film career and uh, his celebrity status. But it's a fascinating story. This is the Hollywood version starring the man who lived it himself. We've got an audio commentary by film historian Steve Mitchell. There's Mitchell again. Uh, and Combat Films, American Realism author Stephen J. Rubin in the theatrical trailer. Hold that up for you guys. Uh, I want to emphasize, again, keep your eyes peeled to SerialAtMidnight.com for full written reviews. I can't talk about these things in these videos like I can talk about them when I write something, right? The, a written review and like, I can be like, hey, I like this and here's why I like it. I think it's really cool, but when you get to actually write something and you get to read it, we can go so much deeper. We can like, it's like multiple layers, right? Inception, inception, inception. We just multiple layers down learning more about these movies and why they're special and the people that wrote them and the people that directed them. And were they on the Hollywood blacklist? They were a communist. But then they went on to do this thing that was this huge family hit. I just wrote a review and I was like, well, this guy was a communist. And then he went on to create this huge family hit. I was like, huh, it's in the review. Uh, let's talk about Jet Pilot. Howard Hughes's Jet Pilot, directed by Joseph von Sternberg. I love the way that they build this because it's got, it's John Wayne, it's Janet Leigh, Jamie Lee Curtis's mom, Tony Curtis's husband. See, sneaker, sneaky Tony Curtis impression. You didn't think that was coming right now. Uh, but it, they, so Howard Hughes, Jet Pilot, starring John Wayne, Janet Lee, and the U.S. Air Force. That's what it says right here. And the U.S. And the U.S. Air Force. That's right, Pilgrim. Um, includes both the 185 
aspect ratio and the 137 version of the film. So you have your... Because fans argue about this stuff, right? And they get real upset if their particular version of something isn't included. So I think it's nice that Kino Lorber is like, you know what, let's just give them both aspect ratios and we'll cut off any potential, you know, any excuses. If you like Jet Pilot, you now have no excuse not to buy Jet Pilot on Blu-ray. Um, but this is great. I'm, I'm excited about checking this out and giving this the full review. Uh, 50s, World War II, 1957. You guys know I love my 50s cinema. Huge 50s cinema fan. Oh, also, huge fan of the Spider-Woman Strikes Back. So, this does have a review. It's available at uh, serialatmidnight.com. It's, I've already posted it. I wrote it. I posted it. It's also at Letterboxd, all the other places. Maybe I say it enough times, you know? And it's also at a card at the or in the, the end screen of every single video. Our letterbox, our website, it's always there. Um, please read my reviews. I work really hard on them. <laughs> just kidding. I mean, I do work really hard on them, but I'm just joking about the whole like plea for reading the reviews. Those of you who know, you know. You know what's up. This movie's amazing. It, I'm not saying it's good because it has a lot of problems, but I love it. It's a universal picture. From 1946, Gail Sondergaard was uh, the Spider-Woman in a Sherlock Holmes mystery movie from, I think, 1943. Um, those Sherlock Holmes movies with Basil Rathbone are great. Those have a Blu-ray set from uh, another distributor, and I have that set, and I love those movies. Universal in the 40s is just, mwah. I mean, the 30s, the 40s, that's where Universal really was just so... They did great. They did great things later, right? But 30s, the monster movies of the 30s and the 40s, and everything that they did with mystery and suspense and chillers. We're going to talk a lot about these in, through this video. But uh, the Spider Woman in the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes movie was played by Gail Sondergaard. So this is not a Sherlock Holmes movie. It's not even a direct sequel. It's not a sequel at all. She's a whole different character. But they're playing up that we know her from that Sherlock Holmes movie. Uh, and Gail Sondergaard, I love her. She's I, I, I find her beautiful. I find her attractive in a way that is both like she seems to enjoy playing with darkness, a beautiful woman that plays with darkness. That is, you know, like the femme fatale sort of a thing. I just think it's great. Um, the cat and the canary, you know, the Bob, Bob hope, um, she's in that as well. She's the kind of the caretaker of this estate that they go out to. She's got like the candelabra and she's like, the spirits are all around you. And Bob Hope's like, can we put him in a glass with some ice? Yeah. Love Gil Sondergaard. So anyway, um, this has Rondo Hatton in it as well. I would be remiss if we didn't mention Rondo Hatton. The man who cult horror fans love so much, they've named an award after him. The Rondo Award. Uh, Rondo Hatton was a... I'm trying to see if there's... That's kind of a good shot of him right there. Uh, he had this disfigurement. He had a glandular condition. He was disfigured. He, you guys seen The Rocketeer? Lothar from The Rocketeer is a straight up homage to Rondo Hatton. It's basically, it is Rondo Hatton. But of course, he passed away so much earlier than he should have because of his condition. Anyway, there's a full review for this. I would love to sit here and talk about it for 20 minutes, but I've already written a review for it. So check it out. And definitely, if you love Universal and you love horror movies and you love suspense and all that jazz, you got to get that. Oh, I also, it's loaded with special features. Uh, we haven't even been doing special features. Us because they're really, have we done, are we up to date? I think we're up to date on all the special. Okay. The only one we've missed was because Jet Pilot had the two aspect ratios. So this has uh, a, a commentary by film historians Tom Weaver, David Schechter. Mistress of Menace and Murder, Making of the Spider-Woman Strikes Back by Ballyhoo. That's a new Ballyhoo documentary feature. Uh, it's got... C. Courtney Joyner. It's got Rick Baker in it, the effects legend, Rick Baker. It's got Fred Olin Ray. I've interviewed two of those three people. That's fast. I've interviewed Fred Olin Ray and I've interviewed C. Courtney Joyner as a friend of Serial at Midnight. It's a great documentary. They really get into like the tragedy of Rondo Hatton and how Universal at this period in time was about to um, kind of close and become something else. Universal phase like 1.0 was about to go away and it was going to become Universal International. And then, you know, after that MCA Universal, this is kind of the end of classic Universal. See what we can do when we have information. This is all in the review. So check out the review. Um, let's talk about the secret of the blue room. This is a 1933 uh, I'm going to call it a mystery. It's a chamber horror, but it's really a chamber mystery movie from 
uh, Universal. It opens with the Swan Lake music that they use for Dracula and the Mummy and uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue. And it stars Gloria Stewart and Lionel Atwill. Gloria Stewart is, of course, much it's like 60 something years later. She's the old lady in Titanic who's like, Titanic was called a ship of dreams. And it was. Uh, but here, she's like in her early 20s. So um, it's it's a lot of fun. These movies aren't long enough to be boring. They're not long enough to really overstay their welcome. They're just like quick, visceral. I mean, you, you knock a few of them out in one sitting. Commentary by filmmaker uh, historian Michael Schlesinger and trailers. I'll hold the back of it up for you so you can freeze frame that bad boy. I enjoyed it. And again, Universal movies from the 1930s and the 1940s, but especially, I mean, 19, this is two years after Dracula, what, one year after Frankenstein. There's a tone, right? And they use the sets from the old dark house. It's in the review. It's serial at midnight.com. Uh, Among the Living. This is a fascinating movie uh, that is... This is the one where we get into like the communist, the behind the scenes communist party, uh, going to jail, the House for Un-American Activities Committee. Um, so real quick, it's Albert Decker as two twins, two brothers, for the Rick and Morty fans out there. Um, it's two brothers. One of them is uh, it's a Southern Gothic noir, which that is kind of special in and of itself because you get Southern Gothic movies, you get noir movies. When you get a Southern Gothic noir and those two things come together, good times. But uh, Albert Decker returns home for the... He, his father has died so that he comes home for the burial. Uh, he's John. And he learns that his brother Paul, who he thought died as a kid 25 years ago, is still alive. And he's crazy. And he's living inside the house that he grew up in. There it goes from there, and it's got really great performances by uh, Susan Hayward, who I always like. Harry Carey is it not not Harry Carey from the, we got Pop Fly out of Zutterfield? Not that Harry Carey, but uh, the uh, the actor Harry Carey. Um, it's also got uh, you know what? No, read the review. Serialmanet.com. Uh, audio commentary by film professor uh, professor and film scholar Jason A. Nay and trailers. <laughs> the night. It's not the, it's just night has a thousand eyes. Got a review for this one coming too. I've already written it. I just got to publish it. Uh, Edward G. Robinson and uh, Gail Russell, John Lund. Gail Russell's a tragic figure, right? We get into this in the review too. Uh, beautiful, tragic, died very young, alcoholism, but she shined so brightly in these movies. This is a uh, Paramount picture from 1948 and uh, Edward G. Robinson. I always want to call him Edgar. Edgar G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson has, he's got the second sight. It's very much like the dead zone. I like, I'm, if I ever get a chance to talk to Stephen King, we'd be like, how much do you love night has night has a thousand eyes? Cause the dead zone has a lot of overlap. And this was based on a book from a very well-respected writer who a lot of had a very influential on, the suspense, mystery, th thriller genre. So I absolutely think that Stephen King read this and probably likes this movie and was homaging him, homaging this with The Dead Zone. Anyway, it's fantastic. Uh, Edgar G. Robinson is great. The trick of this movie is that they tell you how it's going to end and then everyone in the movie tries to stop how it ends. Does it happen anyway? It's fun. It's really good. Uh, audio commentary by film historian Imogen Sarah Smith and the theatrical trailer. Hold that up for you if you want to freeze frame. Deported. Uh, haven't watched this one yet. Marta Torrin and Jeff Chandler, directed by Robert Syed Mack. So that's good, uh, good, uh, high prestige, right? Uh, good, good. What's the word I'm looking for? Trying so hard to cover these. In a, so, because if a video is an hour, less people are going to click it, right? So I want to make the coverage approachable and I'm going too fast. So I'm going to bring it back. Um, Robert Sidemack is a director of um, well-renowned, right? You know what you're getting. These studio directors were so accomplished and capable. There was a basic competency, a basic standard that worked within the studio system that um, should not be underestimated. So, uh, 1950 movie. Um, oh, it's a it's a commentary by film historian Eddie Von Miller and trailers. So I'll have more to say about this after I've seen it, but 
looks good. Uh, slow dancing in the big city. This is, I've heard so many good things about this, but I've never seen it. So it's Paul Sorvino. Slow dancing is falling in love. It's also got uh, Anne Ditchburn. Music is by Bill Conti. This is John G. A John G. Avildsen's film. Now, my memory is that this is the movie that he directed immediately after Rocky. It's the director and the composer of Rocky, the next project after Rocky, right? Rocky was 76. This is 78. Was there something in between? I don't have a computer open to check IMDb, but that's my understanding. Um, anyway, this has... Um, Oh, this is a Scorpion release. It's a Scorpion. There, we, we're also going to be talking about Code Red and Scorpion that Kino distributes. Um, so this has an interview with actor Nicholas Coaster, uh, Coster, sorry, interview with composer Bill Conti, the original trailer. Oh, reversible artwork. Well, here's this artwork. And the alternate cover geez, looks like this. Have you guys seen this and what do you think about it? It's just interesting to me to think of uh, Paul Sorvino as, you know, a romance. I, I associate him so closely with tough guy roles and with, you know, good fellas and things like that. Even Dick Tracy, lips manless. To think of him as the sensitive romantic lead, you know, that's it's interesting. And he's older too, right? He's not, uh, he's no spring chicken. He's not a 20 something. He doesn't have a six pack of abs, you know, it's a different time. Freud. I've also heard great things about this, but I haven't seen it yet. So it's uh, Montgomery Clift, Susanna York, John Huston's production of Freud. Um, it's a 1962 movie. They shot it in black and white, which I think is an interesting choice, probably a deliberate choice when every, so much is being filmed in uh, um, scope, you know, and color to, to get people back from the, the TV, you know, TV had, you're competing with television in this era. So for them to do um, black and white, it's interesting to me. It's also in the one eight five aspect ratio, so it's not not wide. Anyway, uh, it's directed by John Huston, and it's um, the story is by Charles Kaufman. It's a Universal picture. I'm I'm really curious about it because again, I've heard good things. We have got an audio commentary by film historian Tim Lucas and Trailers from Hell with Howard Rodman. You know Joe Dante's uh, Trailers from Hell, where famous people talk about the movies that need more attention. The Accused, another movie that I haven't seen, but I really want to discover it. Loretta Young, Robert Cummings, uh, 1949. Um, I think we can safely put this in the, well, I don't know, noir? Haven't seen it yet. Only know the solicitations and what I've seen, you know, in the, in ordering this and getting everything ready to go for this video, but looks, looks very noir-like, right? So it's a 1949 film. Um, it has an audio commentary by film historian Eddie Von Mueller. Theatrical trailer. Hold this up for you guys. It's got a beautiful cover art too. Kudos as always. I, I've praised Kino and their cover art multiple times in this video, but I will continue to do so because I think that so many people want to reinvent the wheel. Just give us the original art because it's gorgeous and it really stands the test of time. All right, we have a three, a three pack here. We have a three film uh, WC Fields. So W.C. Fields triple play, right? Let's start with uh, It's a Gift. So it's W.C. Fields and Baby Leroy. Yes, my little chickadee. Okay, I won't do that again. I'm sorry. Uh, 1934, it's 68 minutes. That's the thing about these older movies is the, like pre-codes especially. They're super short. You just knock them out. Um, so this comedy legend W.C. Fields is back to his hilarious antics with Baby Leroy from the old-fashioned way. Uh... So I guess we should have started here because that's Baby Leroy um, in the old-fashioned way. This is 1934. This is also 1934. Which came first? I don't know. Well, I can tell you this. This has a commentary by film historian James L. Nabar, uh, author of the W.C. Fields films. And uh, he also does the commentary for this film, 71 minutes, 68 minutes, 71 minutes. And uh, this has a commentary by film historian, filmmaker historian Michael Schlesinger. And it's 1940, so much later, uh, 1940 Universal Picture. There's the back of The Bank Dick. That's a great cover, right? Um, here's the back of It's It is a Gift. He's like uh, Boromir at the Council of Elrond. It is a gift. You didn't know he was homaging W.C. Fields in that scene, did you? 
Tolkien, big WC Fields fan. Star, asterisk, I don't think that J.R.R. Tolkien was a WC Fields fan. He could have been. Maybe he was. This is the back of uh, the old-fashioned way. <laughs> Somebody's going to be like, I don't know, I heard this uh, Serial at Midnight said that J.R.R. Tolkien was a big WC Fields fan. I don't know. The Mystery of Edwin Drood, Claude Rains. Uh, what year is this? 1935. It's not pre-code, but darn close to it. Uh, audio commentary by film historian David Del Val. That's great. And uh, trailers. Claude Rains... The Invisible Man in Casablanca, uh, Heather Angel from The Undying Monster and Lifeboat, David Manners from Dracula and The Death Kiss. Uh, it's a haunting film adaptation of the unfinished novel by Charles Dickens, an opium-addicted choir master. All right, well, this sounds like a pre-code. You throw opium in there, that sounds like a pre-code. Uh, he becomes obsessed with a young student named Rosa Budd. His nephew, Edwin Drood, also holds the torch for the girl. You know, there's where we're going with it. So here's the... Uh, the back of the box we got a that commentary that i mentioned any alternate artwork sometimes you get surprised by the alternate artwork you just like whoa i didn't expect that uh the mad doctor this is what i'm tremendously i'm going to try to work this into my uh well as this video goes up it's going to be darn close to halloween but i'm going to try to work this into some of my thematic halloween era viewing my, my personal viewing 1940 uh basil rathbone who i I've already talked about. I love Basil Rathbone. Ellen Drew, John Howard. It's a Paramount picture directed by Tim Whalen. Um, death lurked in his hypnotic eyes. In this nerve-jangling thriller, The Mad Doctor, the great Basil Rathbone, and is Dr. George Sebastian, a smooth and sinister physician who woos, weds, and murders several of his wealthy patients for their fortunes. Oh. Oh. So that also has a commentary by filmmaker, uh, film, film historian David Del Val who does good commentaries. Uh, this is a 1940. We already did that. It's a Paramount picture. Yeah, okay. So here's the back of the box. If you want to freeze frame, freeze frame. All right, now the rest of these are, uh, this is a Code Red uh, title. I'm not going to, I'm going to let you pronounce that because I just don't want to deal with the backlash from the French or the Canadians particularly. Uh, so I'm going to let you pronounce that. This is the sequel. This is part two. The relationship continues. Now, I never saw part one, so this is going to be interesting for me to... Uh, to Will I be able to to keep up, to know what's going on? Um, but it includes both the original French and English dub audio, so that's cool. You got the two audio choices. Theatrical trailer, optional English subtitles. Uh, I'll hold up the back of the package for you. Any alternate art? No. So of all the movies that, of all the kinds of movies, uh, I am least versed in French films, which I know, right? Like I, I know I do all right with Italian. I do all right with Hong Kong cinema and, and Asian cinema. I do all right with uh, Filipino exploitation all the way. I do really well with that stuff. But the French, like, and, and arguably the French are the reason that, you know, you know, like French, French in film is, uh, like with cuisine, right? Like, it's just like they elevated it to this other thing, to this art form. Uh, I'm very, very, very excited about this. George Papard in One More Train to Rob. We have been getting so many George Papard movies on home media the last few uh, months into the last year or so, even Keenan and Lord themselves released like uh, the Ground Star Conspiracy and PJ. PJ love PJ. Um, a lot of Papard hitting Blu-ray, and so it's I, it's very exciting for me because I love George Papard. I grew up with the A Team, never realizing that that was just you know the kind of the end, and that he had gone back. So that's the great discovery is when you are able to go back. You you know characters for one thing. And then you discover they are so much more than that, that you only knew the tip of the iceberg. And then discovering what made them so great all along. That's a lot of fun. Uh, George Papard, Diane Muldar from Star Trek The Next Generation, Dr. Pulaski, Pulaski from Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek The Original Series. Um, she's, uh, she's a great actress. She's, she's in a lot of 70s TV and, and stuff like this. Uh, John Vernon uh, produced, but who directed this? I'm looking for the director. Uh, directed by Andrew McLaglin. Great. Uh, 1971. We have no special features, but uh, I don't know. It's cool just to have the movie. I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth when we have 
George Papard restored in high definition. Anything alternate? No. But that's what the disc looks like. It's a handsome disc. Handsome disc. Uh, National Lampoon's Movie Madness. Uh, this is the follow-up to Animal House. Animal House was their first movie, the first National Lampoon branded movie. This was the second. And it's a mess. It's a, But not necessarily an unlovable mess. It's got a lot of pieces in it. For me, I don't know that it works. I, it's not, it doesn't make me laugh. It's not funny. But is a... Yeah, that's not even the point of movies sometimes. I mean, if, let me let me rephrase. Part of the fun for being a cinephile, right, is not in whether something is good or if it's not good. It's in looking at how it does it. Um, this movie feels so drenched in drugs. In fact, I've written a review for this as well. It's at serialatmidnight.com. It is so drenched in drugs that it makes it's incoherent. It doesn't follow any sort of structural guidelines, but it has interesting things in it. It has interesting people in it. There's a ton of uh, of cameos. Let me tell you who cameos might not even be the right word. We've got Christopher Lloyd. Uh, we've got Diane, a uh, young Diane Lane, seventies Diane Lane. You think that uh, uh, Streets of Fire is early Diane Lane. This is 70s. This is 19... I'm sorry. This is 1982. They made this movie in... Uh, this movie sat on the shelf for a couple of years because they didn't know what to do with it. And it ended up being um, put basically straight to, to cable, if I remember correctly. Uh, Robbie Benson, who was... You guys know Robbie Benson, right? I'm not going to do his res resume. Richard, Richard Woodmark, Candy Clark. Love Candy Clark. American Graffiti. Uh, Christopher Lloyd... Um, who else? Robert Culp. The great Robert Culp. Julie Kavnar. This is, I believe, Julie Kavnar's first uh, screen. Well, she's the voice of Marge Simpson. But here she's on screen. Dick Miller. Fred Willard. Mary Warrenoff. See, there's great people in here. I just wish they had better things to do. But that's, that's why we buy these things and why we study these things and why we appreciate them long after long after the movies themselves have kind of just gone by the wayside. Uh, no special features here, but again, it's a high definition transfer, so that's the draw. Uh, this comes from Scorpion. This is a Scorpion releasing title, Counterpoint. Charlton Heston, World War II. Uh, I've never seen this. So Leslie Nielsen is in this. This is going to be one of those uh, non-comedic, pre-comedy Leslie Nielsen roles. Here he is right there next to Heston, next to, next to Chuck H. Um... So this is directed by uh, Ralph Nelson, and it is uh, a gripping drama, combines the splendor, classical music, Second World War, Charlton Heston, Maximilian Schell, uh, Catherine Hayes, Leslie Nielsen. Okay, it's a World War II movie with Charlton Heston. This does have special features. Audio commentary by filmmaker historian Steve Mitchell. Steve Mitchell's on a lot of these. Uh, Combat Films, American Realism author Stephen J. Rubin, and the theatrical trailer. There's the back of the box. Beautiful cover, I assume, taken from the original theatrical poster. That's gorgeous art. Anything alternate here? No. Here's your other, the, the Chuck Heston double punch is uh, number one, which I, this is a sports movie. This is like a football movie, which I've never seen this either. I didn't even know this existed, which is part of the fun of these too, right? Because you get the discovery aspect. Like, is this going to come on? Is this on Netflix? I don't think so. I really doubt. I really doubt it. Um, there's Diane Moldar again. All right. Uh, directed by Tom Grease, Charlton Heston, Jessica Walter, Diane Moldar, Bruce Dern. Bruce Dern. Nice. Um, 1969. And we have no special features, but uh, if you want to see Charlton Heston, this is... Is he... No, I'm not going to do it. It's like, what if I just stopped the video and just read the back of the box? And I was like, oh, okay. Okay. I'll have a review for it after I watch it. This is the point of this video is to let you know, hey, these things are coming. If you want to pre-order, get them in. Now, the rest of this stuff is also distributed by Kino Lorber, but it may come from different places. Like, this one comes from Cohen Media Group. This sounds super interesting. It's White as Snow. This is like a modern, sexy version of Snow White. A modern interpretation like if they didn't say it was snow white i don't know that we'd get it but the, so this girl well she's a woman she's not a girl but this this woman i'm thinking snow white right so this this woman i don't think of snow white in the cartoon as a woman but i guess she is uh she she's got the stepmother 
she goes on this sexual liberation and gets the, like instead of seven dwarves how do they how do they say it how do they these are still wrapped because they just showed up and I wanted to throw them in this video so we could have the most comprehensive coverage that we could seven men fall in soon this she starts to take joy in her sexuality and soon one two three seven men fall under her charm um, she's allowed to indulge in no string sex taking pride belonging to no one but then uh, her stepmother re-enters the picture it's, it's sexy snow white right from Cohen Media. There are no special features here, but it's like some of you guys just got really interested in this. Um, I don't know. I'm going to check it out. The Real Bedford Falls. It's a Wonderful Life. So this is uh, the town, the movie, the legend. This is a look at Seneca Falls, New York. Uh, and Bedford Falls, the setting of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. The documentary that examines small town life in Seneca Falls. Um, so this is going to be interesting because how have they embraced their association with it's a wonderful life you know i'm gonna brie and i did a video about it's a wonderful life you know what's interesting about it's a wonderful life is it's not really even a christmas movie christmas takes place but just a fraction of the film and yet it has become this huge christmas annual tradition and look i mean there this is so themed to christmas and it's a wonderful life so i will absolutely be checking this out it's only 30 minutes long uh, does it have any special features? I do not think that it does, but, uh, and it's DVD obviously, but for those that love it's a wonderful life and you want to learn more about like the real town that's embraced that legacy, that sounds cool. Uh, as those, here's another one that I'm, maybe I'll just let you do it. You, that's what it's called. I'm going to, I'll get a shot in Balanchine's classroom. You have to do this in Balanchine's classroom, um, about, Ballet. It's a documentary about ballet. Ballet. This is having a hard time speaking. I've said so many words during this video. Uh, it takes us back to the glory years of Balanchine's New York City. So do it again. Balanchine's New York City Ballet through the remembrances of his former dancers and their quest to fulfill the vision of genius. Um, I just want to pretend it's like fame. You know, the the ballet like fame. Anyway, it sounds interesting. It's uh, 88 minutes long. No special fee. Oh, yeah, additional scenes, bonus features, additional scenes, and trailers. So if you're a Serial at Midnight fan, you like documentaries, and if you are a... Ba Who out there in Serial at Midnight land? Because we cast the wide net. We've got people in the film industry that watch these videos. We've got people from all over the world. Are any of you guys interested in ballet? And I say guys, not as... Are any of you, you all, any of y'all watching this, are you, are you ballet veterans? Have you taken ballet? That would be an interesting conversation to have. Uh, we have another two two punch here. Genesis. Genesis. Um, let me make sure I'm doing these in the right order here. Okay, we have the 2008. Uh, so the one in Rome. This is a documentary about their reunion, getting back together. Having gone their separate ways in March of 1996, the members of Genesis remained best friends and came back together in 2007 for a triumphant sellout world tour when in Rome, performing a lot of their hits like Invisible Touch, Mama, No Son of Mine. They put on a spectacular show. This is that story. This is that show. It's 90 minutes long. Um, no special features. 16 by 9 widescreen. And then this also, Genesis, uh, The Last Domino, question mark. So this is a 2021 documentary. It's 59 minutes long. Um, Genesis it follows Tony Banks, Phil Collins, Mike Rutherford, and their crew as they build and rehearse their last domino tour. Despite the complications of COVID-19, the show goes on. This is the story. So if you're a Genesis fan, you have two new DVDs to add to your collection. Uh, we have two more here. Don't fall over. Don't fall over. Uh, enormous, The Gorge Story. So The Gorge is a famous uh, performing arts venue. How do they describe it? The Gorge has brought over 7 million fans and the world's biggest magician. Magici the world's biggest musicians and magicians, maybe? I don't know, but musicians to a patch of rural Washington farmland 150 miles from nowhere. So they talk to a lot of people that uh, are associated with like big music, like crowds, right? So uh, Dave Matthews, Jason Mraz, Pearl Jam, among many other artists, all of who have a legendary past at the venue. So getting into the history of this musical venue, uh, it looks very cool. I'll be definitely be checking this out. Who are we on the front? Pearl Jam, Dierks Bentley, Steve Miller, um, writer, producer, director, Lisa Downs. Just She just heard Steve Miller and she was like, wum, 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 wum. Her, her radar, her ear just extended. Um, Life After Flash. 
There it is. Life After Flash, Life After the Navigator, Director, Writer, Producer, Lisa Downs. Love Steve Miller. Dave Matthews Band, Jason Mraz, Heart, Shaky Graves, Joseph, and Lake Street, uh, Lake Street Dive. A story, 150, oh, I was going to say 150,000. 15,000 years in the making. One more. Last one. Man in the Field, The Life and Art of Jim Denovan. So this is a guy who's like an artist and a cook chef sort of a thing. How do they describe it here? Provides pioneering artist and chef Jim Denovan um, profiles. I said provides. Profiles, pioneering artist and, sh and chef Jim, Jim Denovan. It's time for this video to end. Uh, the founder of Outstanding in the Field, the radical alternative to the conventional dining experience. Look, this is what we're talking about. Look at all those tables. You just go out in this field and you eat dinner. I'm like, where is the food? Where do they, pre like, presumably on the other side of the camera, there's like a tent and like power, you know, generators and stuff. But I'm like, where is the food? Um, you have the people eating and then the, it's, it's interesting, right? So a lot of documentary stuff here. That's what's cool about Kino Lorber. So we tend to cover the studio classic stuff here because that's really where my heart is, is in old, old studio pitches. I love the pitches. I want to be in the pitches. I want to direct the pitches. I want to produce the pitches. Pitches. That's where my heart is. But the documentary stuff is equally cool. We have documentarians that watch Serial at Midnight. So uh, this is cool to cover. It's cool to talk about. I see no special features here, but the movie is uh, 81 minutes long. It's in widescreen. Um, very cool stuff. So guys, what a massive haul. But this is your Kino Lorber November. This is November. Um, and there's one more coming. We'll talk, it's a 4K. We'll talk. It's going to get its own video as soon as it shows up. But uh, what a what a joy to cover all of these movies and to get to kind of discover them with you because some of these we've talked about in greater detail, but some of them, most of them, have yet they they have I have not yet discovered them yet. So we get to experience that together. And uh, once again, I will reference you over to serialatmidnight.com for uh, almost daily written reviews. There are. Dozens and dozens and dozens of reviews at serialatmidnight.com. Again, if you only follow these videos, you're missing a huge, you're missing the depth, right? The depth is there. We so much deeper than we're able to get into uh, at, at, in the videos themselves. But um, I, I, I take pride in having deeper conversations about this stuff every chance that I get. So thank you so much. If you made it to the end of this video, uh, thanks for that too. That's who made it to the end of the video? Uh, Bezelborb. Bezelborb. But did you make it to the end of the video? Put Bezelborb in the comments of this video. Let's see. Then uh, it'd be nice to know who, who stuck around. Did you stick around? Bezelborb. Guys, thanks so much. Take care. Thanks to Kino Lorber for just being awesome in general. You can pre-order these from Kino Lorber. I'll also put links in the, oh, that's, that's like 30 links. You can pre-order them. I'll put links in the description of this video. You can just click right through. Anything that you click through uh, will be supporting Serial at Midnight. Thank you so much. Take care. Until next time, here's where to go and what to do.